All right, this is gonna be a video for a, a fun little pattern. It's it's fall and it's uh, getting into Isonychia season here. So I like to kind of focus on these when this time of year comes around. So in the vise, I've got a size 12 curved nymph hook. Um, I usually tie these in 14, but there's a, there's a technique with the body that's a little, uh, not so much in depth, but I wanna make sure that it's really clear what we're doing here. Uh, so I'm gonna tie this one size bigger in a size 12. Uh, I'm going to use two types of thread. Here is a uh, 18 knot nano silk for the body, which might seem, you know, kind of small for this size nymph, but I want to make sure that with the number of things that we're going to have to tie in that we minimize build up here. So I'll kind of explain, you know, as we go through why we're using two different, two different types of thread. So I'm going to start my thread around right here, and I'm going to use my thread to measure my thorax area. So that's about good right there. So I'm just going to get that going down the body and we'll get our scissors in there, get that excess snipped off. Don't break it off because it's nano silk and you're not going to be able to break it because it's great stuff. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to take a brown Sharpie and I'm just going to kind of make a mark right there. All I'm doing is marking where I started my thread. And the reason why is this nano silk is just really, really thin. Uh, really clear. It's in an, and when you wrap it onto the shank, it's uh, it's kind of hard to see. And where I started my thread is kind of important because that's what I'm using to measure out my thorax area. So I just want to make sure I know exactly where that is. Now the first material I'm going to tie in is I have a large piece of ostrich hurl, and I'm going to go up towards the top, and I'm going to find three strands that have really narrow tips. So we're gonna kind of look like that. So I'm gonna take those, lay those on top of the hook shank, get them tied in, and I'm just gonna pull that out and kind of measure how long I want this tail. And right there is about good. So once I get the length worked out, I'm gonna work my way down the hook Get all that tied in, and we're off and running. So I'll get some of that out of there. Okay, now, th this step's not absolutely necessary, but you know, once these fibers get wet, they are gonna wanna stick together and you're gonna lose a little bit of the structure of the tail. So if I take this one piece, fold it back, put a thread wrap in front of it, and then take the far strand, pull that out, put a thread wrap in front of it. That'll splay those tail fibers out a little bit. And the reason why I like making sure that I do that is because when it gets wet, it will kind of hold them apart a little bit. So that kind of helps when the fly is in the water and one of the reasons why presentation on this nymph is a little bit more important than presentation with other nymphs is because isonychias are, they're, they're interesting little things. They're, they're little swimmer nymphs, um, and, and they're actually pretty good little swimmers too. So the way that you fish these, you can obviously fish them as a regular nymph and dead drift them and all that kind of stuff, but I actually fish these nymphs by giving them little strips uh, in slack water close to shore. Um, that's how I fish these, and man, is it a blast, because you get some really, really fiery strikes, uh, and it's pretty cool. And you can also tell when the isonychias are, are active. You can see a lot of their shucks on rocks. Um, they, don't, they, they, don't, they don't hide their emergence uh, very well, so you can definitely tell when they're around. Now, this is a just cheap uh, white neck. Uh, you can get a rooster neck, you can get a number of different things, and it doesn't even really have to be a neck. It could be a number of different feathers. Uh, but what I'm actually at after is, you can barely see it there, but I'm after this white quill. I'm not even after the feather, I just want the quill. Uh, if you look at a lot of Isonychia nymphs, they're, they're pretty well known for having that prominent white stripe down their back. Um, but the one thing that I will say is that is not a universal feature. Um, not all ISO nymphs have that. I, I have fished several rivers where I have I have seen the ISOs and they don't have any bit of a white stripe at all. Um, so if you're big on matching hatches and all that kind of stuff, 
uh, just pay attention to the rocks, find the nymph, uh, see what features that they're, uh, they're exhibiting, and you can match up your fly that way. My area, they definitely have this white stripe, so I'm going to want that. Okay, so next order of business, I'm going to take two more strands of the ostrich hurl. Now, I took these strands from a little bit further down the quill because I want uh, a little bit of a thicker piece of material here. I want the real thin ones for the tail, but I want them thicker for how I'm going to do the body. So I'm going to take the two pieces, I'm going to split them apart, I'm going to slide them over my shank. I'm going to spin my thread. Get those cinched in. There, they don't have to be perfect. Once I get them in, I'm going to make sure that I'm holding them out and keeping them on opposite sides of the shank. You want one of those pieces of material on the side closest to you, the other piece on the opposite side and just hold them as you go down. You can also tie them in at the back and, and wrap your thread towards the front too and just not care how your thread grabs it, it doesn't matter. And you can see we've already got quite a few things that we tied in here, so that's one of the reasons why we're trying to avoid all that bulk with this really thin nano silk thread. Just keep getting all that secured. And, the, and, and I don't really need to go all the way back towards the front and continuously secure it all the way to the front. The only reason why I'm doing that is I do want a little bit of bulk. You know, I don't want this to be a super slender fly. I want it to have a little bit of substance to it. All right, so the very next piece of material, which I hope this works for the video because that little chunk there is all I have left. I've got to buy another package of this. Um, this is a package of the of brown scudback. Uh, you can use a lot of different things for this. I've used pheasant tail before. Um, the only reason why I like this better than the pheasant tail is the pheasant tail is... An, is I, it, it, the reason why I don't like it is the reason why it's a great material because it's it's modeled. It has coloring. It has all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, I, and I don't want that. I don't want the modeling and the coloration on the pheasant tail to overpower the other features that I'm trying to show in this fly. So I just stick to... Really basic. Oh, you know, I was afraid of that. I'm on the tail end of this material, so I've had it for quite a long time. Which means it's dry and it's brittle. So it's breaking on me. All right. So I just paused the, the recording. I said a minute ago that this is... Uh, a, a, a step where you can substitute quite a few different materials. So uh, I'm going to prove that to you and I'm going to use a different material because that, that scud back is just too dry and brittle and uh, I got to order more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the other materials I was going to mention you can use as well. And it's probably the best material other than the scud back, which is a piece of turkey. So I got a piece of turkey tail here. Uh, the turkey tail has uh, strips of fibers that have far less features than a pheasant tail. Uh, a lot less modeling, a lot less coloration, and it's really just a, a, a dark colored uh, piece of material. So that's what that's what we're going to want here. So I'm going to tie that in and advance my thread back down to the tail where all of that is tied in. I'm manipulating my ostrich here while I do that, and I don't really want that to happen. So let's just fold everything back and get our thread back to where it needs to be. And all the way back towards the front again. Okay. Next material is uh, a little weird, but it's something that you can find pretty easily. Uh, this is a... I'm going to try to hold this up here. This is a piece of... Not a piece of, but this is embroidery floss. Now, you can find this at any craft store. You can I got this one at Michael's. Um, so you can find this pretty much anywhere. Now, when you take the floss out, and you have a full piece of it that's about that thick. Get off the, get out of there. You can see how it's about that thick. But this floss is really just made up of a bunch of single strands. So all you're going to do is take whatever size you're tying this fly, pull that material apart, and only use as many strands that'll give you the thickness that you want. So what I'm going to be using is this. I pulled three strands for a size 
uh, 12 or 14. Um, you can even go a little bit, you can go four or five if you want to just add a little bit more size to the body. Um, but that's, that's what I use for this size fly. So I have three strands of embroidery floss that I'm going to wrap onto my hook. Now, one of the other things that I want to say while I'm securing this is an isonychia is, a, again, a little bit of a different nymph. I fish it differently. I tie it differently. Uh, but when you tie this, you probably should pay attention to the fact that an isonychia is not really the buggiest nymph. Uh, a lot of mayfly nymphs, when you flip a rock and you look over at them, they seem to kind of like hold water. Um, and that's why when you tie them with, with you know, buggy materials that absorb water, uh, as long as you're, you're getting that nymph shape in the buggy look, whatever nymph you tie is probably going to catch fish. Um, and that's not completely untrue for isos either. Uh, but isonychias are a little less buggy than other nymphs. They're swimmer nymphs. Um, so but with them being a swimmer nymph, uh, they're a little bit they're a little bit more hard. They don't look like they're absorbing water as much. Um, they have a different shape to them. This area here, the abdomen area, has uh, little flippers that kind of stick out. I don't know if they also help absorb oxygen and double as gills. Um, I'm not sure about that. But this whole area here has those things sticking out. Uh, and it's a little bit more firm to be streamlined to be able to swim. So an ISO has a little bit of a different structure to it uh, than a regular nymph does. So probably should pay attention to that a little bit. So this is the, is the step that I want to make sure that we're kind of paying attention to here. It's not difficult, but it does take some getting used to. This is how I tie all of my caddis pupas. So what I'm going to do is I have the floss kind of sticking straight out from the side of the hook shank. And what I want is when I wrap it over the top, I want it to secure this piece of ostrich churl. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to take this piece of ostrich churl and I'm going to wrap it around the base of my floss. And then as my hurl is facing towards the front of my hook, I can make my first wrap with floss and it'll secure it. Now, on the back side of the hook, same thing. I want, that, I want that hurl to face the front of the hook. So what I've got to do is I have to come around underneath the floss, hold it forward, and then complete my wrap to secure it. And that'll keep it from flying all over the place. Now, I'm doing this kind of slow. But once you get the hang of this, you can just go boom, boom, boom all the way to the front and uh, get that tied in pretty quickly. I've, I've shared this same technique on some of my other videos. Uh, if you look at the video for uh, my caddis pupa, uh, I believe I do this technique in that as well. That's not a particularly difficult thing to do. You just have to make sure that you train your fingers on what to grab and when. So again, on the side closest, we'll go under the floss wrap it around the base, and then point it towards the front as we make our wrap. On the back side, take the hurl underneath. Oops, I went the wrong way because I didn't flip it. We're going to go over the top of it. And then point it towards the front and complete our wrap. And we're just going to continue this process all the way up. And the reason for doing this is it, is it produces a nice kind of like guild type look sticking off the side. Really great technique for caddis pupa. And I've merged it over into uh, my isos as well. So just keep wrapping. And the only thing that really is a little bit of a pain in the butt when you do this is what do I grab? Where do I put pressure? You know, because you got so much going on here. You gotta you gotta keep pressure on the hurl and you gotta keep pressure on the uh on the floss. Now the one thing I want to point out too while you're doing this, don't put too much pressure on the ostrich when you're holding it towards the front because that quill definitely can break. Uh it's a sturdy enough material to not have to worry about it like peacock, uh, but it's not the strongest thing in the world. So you just want to make sure that you're not putting too much pressure on it. Oops. And I have broken it many, many times. And 
And the combination of it being wrapped around the floss and then being mashed down by the turkey is what allows those things, the, the fibers to stick out towards the side and really mimic whatever those little things are that allow this nymph to swim. And these, these are cool little nymphs to fish. They, they really are. And you're, when you're taking light strips with not a streamer, but a little nymph and fish smash it, it's, it's a good time. I like fishing these in slack water. Especially on the on the Delaware, you got a lot of side areas where even though the water is a little bit more dead, it's still very cold. Fish still roam those areas for all kinds of different food sources. And it's a good spot to throw a little isonymph and strip it in. You can probably I should have made this in a way where you can fast forward through this part, but I didn't. So deal with it. Uh, let's see. Let's go. Yeah, that's good right there. So now I'm just going to take my thread and just secure everything that I just did. And once you get a few wraps in there, you don't have to worry about being cute or neat or anything. You're just going to slip your scissors in there and let's just chop off everything. Get all that out of the way. And then we'll take some wraps to clean up some of that excess. And we're going to go ahead, get a whip finish in here. And we'll get that thread right off of the hook. Get that right out of there. Okay, so there's that part. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with some brown vivas, a little bit of a thicker thread. Uh, a little bit of a thread that's uh, that's more uh, typical for tying this type of fly and this size of a fly. So we're going to get that tied in and we're going to work it right back to where we ended our body. And take that turkey, fold it directly over the top, hold that tight with your fingers, because again, you don't really need any sort of like, you know, bugginess to the fly or anything. These are These are pretty firm nymphs. So we'll go we'll get that tied in and get that out of there. But the chunk of turkey that I just cut off, I'm not going to throw that away. I'm going to hold that off to the side because I'm going to turn right around and I'm going to tie that right back on. In the meantime, I'm going to take this quill. I'm going to fold it over the top, hold it with my finger and get that tied in nice and tight and make sure that you take a wrap right up close to where your, uh, where your turkey tail is. Uh, ends because you're going to want that to uh, you're going to want that quill to bite down in there and then I'm going to take the same quill we're not going to cut it I'm just going to bend it towards the back and rewrap it all the way back to where I started we'll get that secured in our material clip get that out of the way and we're still humming right along that's kind of what we're looking at so far Okay, so now we're going to take that turkey that we just cut off and let's just put that right back on top of the hook shank and get that tied back in. I, I like to use the same one because if you look down the back of an ISO, they, they, it just kind of looks like it's the same thing all the way from back to front. So I like to be consistent with the quill, with the wing case, all that stuff. All right, take your finger. Put it in there. Let's pull out a bunch of thread. Make a dubbing loop that we can tie back to where we started our thorax. Pull our thread back to the front and tie that off. Now, what we're going to want to do is we want a little bit of bugginess to the thorax area because um, this fly does have uh, some pretty prominent legs. Now, one material that I use quite often is in this bag, it's called deer hair dubbing. Uh, it's basically just regular dubbing, but it's got deer hair mixed into it. Uh, I'm not gonna use that on this fly because this particular color of deer hair dubbing is a little too light and it's gonna contrast that quite a bit. Um, but I also use another material as well. I love this CDC dubbing. It's a, it's a 
regular dubbing made out of CDC. It's basically just CDC feathers all chopped up. Um, and those fibers are mixed into a dubbing. And I use that quite a bit. And this is a really, really good material for the front of an ISO because not only does it give you um, the thorax that you're looking for, but you get plenty of fibers sticking out to mimic those legs. And it's, a, it's an excellent material for the thorax of this fly. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm just going to kind of mash it together like that. And then I'm just going to pick it out and form a long piece of dubbing that looks like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow that to keep its shape. I'm going to open up my loop with my dubbing twister. Or dubbing loop twister, whatever the hell you call these things. And that all fell apart on me, but it really doesn't matter because I trim this anyway. So I'm just going to take as much of that material as I can and get that inserted into the dubbing loop. It doesn't really matter if I lose a bunch of it or overdo it because, like I said, at the end, I want it to be condensed and I'm going to trim it. So just ram a bunch of that CDC dubbing right up into your dubbing loop. And then hold it, give it a spin, and let that lock in. If you don't have one of these dubbing twisters, you really should get one. They're great tools. The hand one works just fine to just keep, you know, twisting by hand. There's no problem with that at all. But these ones where you just flip it and spin it are really pretty awesome. I'll show you which one I have when I'm done with this. But I'm just taking a piece of Velcro here, picking all that stuff out. Get my uh, hackle pliers. And we're just going to start wrapping this to make our thorax. Now when you first wrap this, you're going to have material all over the place. And it's going to look like it's kind of overkill, because it kind of is. But we're going to fix that. I want some some material sticking out for the legs and I want it kind of dense so that's why I put so much dubbing in there because it wraps up and, and kind of solidifies as you spin your loop. Right, let's get that out of there. All right this is what I use for that. One of these tools here the name of it is right there Smayan or however you pronounce it but these are great you know you can squeeze it and it opens up your loop Give it a spin, it'll tighten everything right up. So let's move all that material back. And we're going to take our turkey tail and we're just going to come right over the top, mash all that material down, and let's get a thread wrap in the eye there. Let's repeat that for our quill. Get that over the top. You don't want to tie the quill in too, too tight because it could slip down inside the turkey tail fibers and then just be lost. You don't want that. So we'll come in here get all this snipped off. And that's pretty much it for the tying portion. We're just going to come in and kind of clean this up a little bit. So we'll come in, get a nice prominent head on there. I got that floss all wrapped in my whip finisher. I'll come in, whip finish that off, get rid of our thread. If you want, you can add a little bit of head cement. I know if I don't, I get all kinds of comments to do that. Everybody knows I'm not exactly a big fan of head cement, but this is a fly where you know you can you can get that nice little glossy head on there and I kind of like that. Does it catch more fish? Doubt it, but I like it. That's all that matters. So let's cure that up a little bit. Okay, so I said in the beginning that ISO nymphs are not particularly buggy. So if you look at what we have here, we obviously have the exact opposite. We have an unbelievably buggy fly with stuff sticking all over the place. Um, but that CDC has clumped up nicely when I did the dubbing loop. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take my scissor points and I'm just going to kind of move all these fibers to the area where I want them, sticking straight out. 
And all I'm going to do is just hold them and no real rhyme or reason to it. Just going to give it a little trim there. Get that cut off. Give a little trim on the bottom. And what I want is this transition point from the body to the thorax. I want that to be a little bit cleaner. So I'm just going to kind of stick my scissors right up in where that happens and snip those fibers off so that they're not crowding that. I, I want those gills, I want those swimming mechanisms, all that kind of stuff for this fly. I want those to be clearly visible. So I don't want to crowd them too much with too much CDC dubbing. Another thing too you can do with this fly if you want is you could resin the body. Um, you could take some resin and put that over the back and shine that up a little bit too. I'm not going to do that here. Um, I don't think I really need to, but trim those a little bit. So all I really want is I just want that CDC dubbing kind of sticking out like that. And that looks pretty good there. Tail is nice and splayed. So that is pretty much it. That is our Isonychia nymph. Fun little fly. You can you can dead drift it. You can do a lot of different things with it. Um, you're going to want all of these little fibers here to be sticking off the side. So that Ostrochurl kind of accomplishes that. Um, that CDC dubbing is going to take care of the legs for you. Uh, you could weight it if you want. You can do a lot of different things to get it down a little bit more. Um, this is really a, a, a just a you know middle of the current, kind of slower water. Uh, strip it like a little streamer. Um, but if you want to get it down a little further, there's you can do a bead, you can do weight, a lot of different things. Uh, but it's a cool little pattern, and it can be fished a lot of different ways. But even if you do dead drift them, I would definitely try uh, giving them little strips because it's it's really pretty fun when you're stripping a little Isonychia nymph and it gets crushed like a streamer. A lot of fun. So there's that. Uh, any questions or anything, just leave them in the comments.